the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from pastors here at the Rock. Father, we just thank you for 24 years of your greatness and your goodness and your mercy. This has been a healthy, healthy church, Lord, one that exalts the name of Jesus, one that builds the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of a man, one where the Holy Spirit is our teacher and your healer, and edifier of every way. And we thank you, Father, that there's another 24 plus 24, 24 until Jesus comes, whenever that is. And we'll give you the praise and give you the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, everybody say amen. <laughs> Deborah. Good morning, and we are quickly losing time. It's been a great morning so far. This is our second service. And I want to wish you happy birthday, Rock Church. And 24 years ago, we did start with 12 people. And we were in the Econo Lodge, and there was a box of Kleenex there. And it was because there was broken hearts. Jim didn't want to be a pastor. But he had just come back from Nigeria, and he didn't want to be a missionary. So there you are. <laughs> but we knew that God had called us to the city and specifically San Bernardino. And God had spoken a word to us. And God, in the word, said, I've put wool on your backs, and I've sent you back out into the sheepfold. And you're going to need mercy and not receive it, so that when you hold the shepherd's rod in your hand again, you will learn how to give mercy to my people. And that began a journey for Jim and I of learning how to pastor with the eyes of Jesus and the heart of the Holy Spirit of loving people to life. And there wasn't probably a better place that we could learn and have online and on, on forever training as in San Bernardino, right, Manon? Because it was a hurting city 24 years ago, and it's even a more hurting city today. And San Bernardino is not a growing city. It has negative growth. And God said that he's going to shine his light in a very dark place, and that's here. And when you see what God has done in 24 years, Jim and I are, of course, astounded because we never dreamed that he would do what he's doing. And I have in my heart now a great anticipation that there's, this is just phase one. We, we built the foundation, but phase two is up and coming, the generations of our children, and they have a dream in their hearts, and they have an anointing on their lives, and they're going to take this place further, faster, and fur farther than we've ever dreamed of going, and that is why we've got to stand up and not put a debt on them for the next generation. And we're not going to talk about that today, but today we are going to ask you to bring a gift. A gift to get this church through the summer. We have a saying around here that we live on fumes and faith. Do you know what that means? How many know what that means, fumes and faith? Yeah, y'all do. Gas tank is almost empty. You're praying and believing God to get you home or get you where you need to go without running out of gas, right? And faith, because faith is God's economic system. And he says the just will live by faith. And God takes the little and makes it great. And that's what I want to talk to you about just quickly, is that there's a, an, an event that happened in the Gospels. It's written four times. Four Gospels have recorded it. And it's the only event other than the resurrection that is in all four Gospels. And it's not Jesus' birth, but it's the story of feeding 5,000 men plus men and women five loaves, and two fish. And the reason it's in the Gospels so many times is because obviously God's making a point to us. And I want to just get, if you'll give me just five minutes, and then we need to get Jim up here and get into the meat of what he wants to say as our senior pastor. But in Mark, I'm sorry, in, in John chapter 6, you'll find this event in Matthew the 14th chapter, and Mark the 6th chapter, and Luke the 9th chapter, and in John the 6th chapter. We're going to go to John. In verse 5 it says, And Jesus lifted up his eyes, and seeing a great multitude coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we buy bread that these may eat? 
But he's, this he said to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. And I love that because when we don't have a plan and there's always more need than there is resource. And I'm sure Philip looked at that, as did the disciples, and he went, oh my gosh, OMG, what are we going to do? But Jesus always has a plan. And I love that. When we don't have a plan, we can rest assured he has a plan. But he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may have even a little. Verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish. But what are they among so many? And I want to just stop there and I want to say that this event recorded four times for you and I to see is relevant in the 21st century at the Rock Church with our gift today. Because there's more need than there is resource. There's tough times. We don't know how we're going to do it. And all of a sudden, in this event, comes a child. And Jesus said, unless you enter the kingdom of heaven like a child, you'll never get there. And this kid, for whatever reasons, he had five loaves and two fish. It was his. He owned it. It was on his person. He hadn't eaten either. And somewhere, somehow, that kid made his way to Andrew, gave Andrew the five loaves and the two fish, and Andrew took the fish and the loaves and handed them to Jesus. So somewhere, it started with a kid who had something, who had a willing heart to give what he had and what he needed to the leadership that was looking out over 5,000 men plus, men plus women and children. So it could have been up to 15, 20,000 people. And for some reason, that kid didn't look at his little bit and think, oh, well, this is useless. I might as well eat it or sell it because it's not going to do any good. He didn't say that. He handed it to Andrew. Andrew handed it to Jesus. And Jesus took it and gave thanks for it and broke it and passed it back to the disciples. And it fed the thousands upon thousands. And they collected 12 baskets left over. Now, the point is, God takes the foolish things of this world to absolutely confound the wise. Jesus knows that there is more need than there is a natural resource. But we're not in a natural kingdom. We're in a supernatural kingdom. And he is training his church to learn how to be like him. So that when there is great need, that there is not a church that says, oh, well, wish I could do something, nothing I can do about it. There's a church that steps up in faith and a heart that is willing and says, well, you know what? Here, this is what I got. Here you can have it. And instead of saying, what good is this? The leadership says, let's give it to Jesus. Let's let him give thanks. Let's let him multiply it. We'll take it back, God, and we'll feed the thousands with it. So whatever you're bringing today, Whatever it is, put it in your hand. Give it to Jesus. Give him thanks. And together, let's believe that it will more than meet the needs that this church has and the heaven assignment on us for this year, for the rest of the year. So, Rock Church, happy birthday. We love you. We are proud of you. We are blessed to be in ministry with you. So good. I'm going to ask uh, the guys in the back room, John, if that's back there, and the sixth chapter of John, in verse number nine, could you just pop that up where Debbie was reading? And, it's, and I want you to underline, but what are they among so many? And that's speaking of the loaves and the fishes. Could you underline, but what are they, or highlight, but what are they among so many? Because that's really what she's saying is that you bring this in and you think, ah, my part means nothing. I might as well just keep it. It's really nothing at all. But God takes it and multiplies it and makes it work. Let me share some things with you out of the scripture in just a moment. I want to take you to Deuteronomy. And the reason I, I want to take you to Deuteronomy, it takes us right back to the very beginning where God was teaching 
really etiquette to the people. People didn't have an idea about how to do God, how to be with God, how to approach God, how to have the things of God, how to operate in the ways of the Lord. And so God is speaking to the people and teaching them and training them. Well, you know, we have our own ideas about how to do things, don't we? It all comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil where we can make our own choices, come up with our own conclusions and follow our own directions. And God's looking simply for a people who won't do things their way, but do things his way. It's that simple. And God is giving instructions to the people on how to be with him, how to hear from him, how to approach him, how to bless him, how to be there with him. And he makes a statement that I thought was fascinating. And may I read it to you? In Deuteronomy, the 16th chapter, starting in verse 16, it says, three times a year, all of the males shall appear here before the Lord your God in the place in which he, notice the capital H of the word he, meaning God, chooses. At the feast of the leavened bread, at the feast of the weeks, and at the feast of the tabernacle, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. They shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. And you say, why would God say I could come before him and have to have something to give? Because giving, if you will, displays the reality of your heart. If you want to demonstrate love, you don't demonstrate it by buying roses. You don't demonstrate it by being a nice person. You don't demonstrate it by being congenial. You don't demonstrate love by words, cheap oftentimes. You demonstrate love by the giving of yourself for the betterment of someone else. It's a sacrificial expression. I'm giving up my ways. I'm giving up what I want. I'm giving up what I feel. I'm giving up what I need. Not just in words, but I, with my life. And God knows that we're a people that are a lot of words, but don't follow up oftentimes our words with what we are and who we are, sacrificially. God knows that if you're going to demonstrate, if you will, the love that you have for God, it's not just in singing a song, it's not just in going to church, it's not just being nice to your neighbor, but it's really displayed when you are grateful and have something in your hand that you're giving up to God. Notice the next verse, if you will, verse number 17. In verse number 17, it says, every man shall give as he is able. And I know a lot of people read that and immediately say, see, therefore I'm out, doesn't mean anything. I can only give what I have. He didn't say that. And a lot of times people say, I don't have anything, so I don't have to give anything, because it says, let every man give according to what he is able. He not one time mentions money, but we see, think of it in terms of money. And then he describes what Abel is, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given to you. Not according to what your wallet, checkbook, or savings account says, but according to what your heart says. I am a grateful person because I'm saved. I'm grateful God's blessed me. God's gone before me. God opens doors that no man can open, closes doors no man can close. God is on my side. I'm in his family. I now have his DNA. I'm washed by his blood. My sins are forgiven. God has truly blessed me. And when you look at giving based on what God has blessed you with, not with what you have in your pocket, then what you have in your pocket isn't anything compared to what comes out of your heart. And now you can go and approach the Lord when your hand is not empty. I said this earlier, the proof of your love is in your giving. How do I know that? For Jesus so loved the world that he, God so loved the world he gave. Jesus goes to the cross sacrificially giving of himself. Now I'll just pop it up on the overhead for you in 2 Corinthians the 8th chapter, verse number 9, just pop it up. It says, for you know the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ that through he was rich. Don't you know he was rich? 
Stop and think about what heaven's like. The streets are paved with gold, my friends. Asphalt in heaven is gold. The trillions of angels that worshipped him and praised him. He was described as the king of all kings. The creator of the heavens and of the earth. My goodness, was he rich. Instead of staying in that position, he gives of himself to not just use words, but to display his love. So God teaches the children of Israel, when you come before me, don't come with an empty hand. He says, he was rich, yet for your sakes became poor. Do you imagine that the king of glory comes and is born in a manger? The very first breath he ever took was probably the stench of an animal urine. Can you imagine what heaven must have smelled like? The fragrances of heaven where it's perfect and there's nothing whatsoever in heaven except the perfect fragrances of heaven itself beyond that which we could ever imagine down here on this planet. And yet the very first breath he takes is that of animal yearn in a manger. Becomes poor because the proof of love is what you give. When I love my wife, it's not, it's not because I... She loves me, and I think that's great of her. I love my wife because I give to her, and I give to her myself. I have to give up my ways and my thoughts and my ideologies and my philosophies and sometimes my wants. You notice how I said sometimes, not all the time. <laughs> but that's my way of expressing, oh, I love you. And he comes along and he says that, in his poverty, might, you might, and I might become rich. It's really powerful, the very demonstration of coming before the Lord God with something in your hand says way beyond what's in your mouth. It really doesn't say anything about what's in your wallet. It really says what's in your heart. In fact, let's take a look at it just for a moment. If you'll go one chapter over in the ninth chapter, verse number five of 2 Corinthians, notice what it says. It says this, therefore... I thought it necessary to exhort the brethren to go to you ahead of the time to prepare your generous gift beforehand. See, here's Paul preparing the church to give. That's what I'm doing this morning. I'm exhorting you. I'm encouraging you. Why? Because if you're not exhorted, oftentimes, if you're not encouraged, oftentimes, you won't do it and it won't happen. I didn't want to be a pastor. I wanted this church to fail. I was a businessman, had a great business working. I was building homes and making lots of money and just had abundance and God wouldn't let me out of pastoring. So I said, well, I won't take up an offering in the church, it'll go broke. So I'll put the offering basket in the foyer. And then therefore, when it goes broke, it won't be my fault. God kept telling me to put my offering in. My offering sustained the church for three years. Don't think for a moment there's just a few of you that gave anything during that period of time. A handful of people that were faithful. Certainly not enough to make it work. My point being is this, is this, I've, you're necessary to exhort the brethren to go ahead time and prepare for a generous gift in which you had previously promised. Go to the last part of that verse. That it may be ready as a matter of generosity that's what we want today is all of us generously coming before the Lord from our heart. Now listen to this. And not as a grudging obligation. Verse number six comes along in the ninth chapter and says these words. But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, but he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Here's a whole scenario if you want to know everything. What you sow you will reap. Not just in your money and your finances, but in your life. So, so many people say to Deborah and I as we approach our older ages and see our dozen grandkids come to serve the Lord and our kids serving God and us loving each other in our old age, what's the key to all this? What you sow, you reap. We were just so broken and down, we decided to go for it. Let's go all out, wholehearted. Let's chase God. Let's believe his word. Let's stand on the things that God says and not what we feel or see or think. And we went in there and we deposited our whole heart into God. And today what you see is a result of what you sow, you reap. 
and it hasn't stopped. We've been waiting for a county. We own some property in another county, not San Bernardino County, and it's kind of an arrogant county, and we've been battling with them, and they owe us some tax money. They owe us over $6,000 in tax money. It took us a year to get it from them. They finally coughed it up. Deborah, a couple of weeks ago, got a check in the mail for over $6,000, and she said, and I'm saying this to you for a reason. I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this as an illustration, an example of giving from your heart and sacrificially bringing something that's important to you. And if I can ask you to do that, then you need to know I'm doing it also. And I'm using myself as an example for this, not as something that you can puff up over and you think greatly of me. I'm only using, I wish I didn't have to use it as an example, but I want you to know that as we got that check, Deborah said this to me, oh boy, I've been waiting to buy this new couch. <laughs> she described the couch and she knew what it looked like and described the chairs that were gonna go with the couch. And I said, great. She said, that okay with you? I said, yeah, whatever you want. I could care less about that stuff. Do whatever you want, it's okay with me, I, I don't care. Then this last week we were out with some French pastors, they were from France, and they were discouraged and their heart was heavy. In their city, a secular city who doesn't believe in God at all, the city finances built a mosque, but the city finances wouldn't even acknowledge them as a religious organization. They've been there fighting the good fight of faith as Christian pastors. So all of a sudden after dinner that night, Deborah took out her checkbook and two thirds of what we'd gotten went to them. I'm saying it just so you'll know that that's what love and sacrifice is all about. And I said, what are you gonna do with the other 4,000 plus? She says, there's four services that we'll be giving it. I'll like to split it up with all of them and give it all away. She, I said, okay. <laughs> I didn't say that to brag. I said that as an example for you. If I'm expecting you to do that sacrificially, you need to know your pastors do it every day and all the time. Just the way it is. It goes on in the next verse. It says these words. It says, so let him... Everyone give according to purpose of in his heart. So it didn't say give according to what you have. It said give according to what's in your heart. What's in your heart, not your wallet. Didn't talk about money. Not grudgingly are of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Verse number eight. And God is able to make all grace abound towards you that you always have all sufficiency and all things and may have an abundance for every good work. There's a promise following that you can't outgive God. In a few moments, I'm gonna let you go and they're gonna bring out a chest out here. It's kind of a little wood chest and you can come forward. The Bible says, bring all of your tithe. So I want you to bring your offerings to get out of your chair. Bring it, grab your stuff, and head home and come to a party tonight of celebration. But when you bring something, bring what's in your heart. Feel, feel what you bring. Don't give if you can't feel it. Because then you're coming to the Lord with an empty hand. But when you can feel it on the inside, something you needed, something you wanted, something you're giving up to honor the Lord, God sees that and God blesses it. But first, I want everybody to remain seated. Hear me now, hear me. I want everybody to remain seated. Nobody get up, I'm gonna teach you some church etiquette right now. Nobody get up, nobody leave. I want to make sure the most important part of every service here at the Rock Church and World Outreach Center is making sure every person that comes to church here is right with God. So sit down. You say, Pastor, you're getting mean. I don't mean to be mean. I'm just going to be tough enough to get you to sit still. Still. I don't want you to lose souls for me. So sit still. Let's talk. I want you to, I want to ask you a question. I want you to check yourself out. If you were to walk out of this building and your heart stopped and you died, bang! 
And you open your eyes after you're dead and you're in hell, or would you be in heaven? Check yourself out. Where would you be if you died in the next few minutes? Did you know that your answer says a lot about where you're at with God? Some of you might have said this as an answer. Pastor Jim, you need to know that I, I think I'd make it. I think I'd make it. But can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can think your way into heaven. Like I think, I think, I think, I think. You're not going to make it because it doesn't say positive thinkers get to go to heaven. Some of you might have said, well, I hope that if I died, I'd go to heaven. I guess what? Nowhere does it say whoever hopes the most gets to go to heaven. It's not in the Bible. Some of you might say, well, Pastor Jim, wait a minute. Hold on. Did you know that I love God a whole lot? Give my money to charity, take care of my neighbor. I'm really a good person, and I love God. I, I, I guess I'm going to make it. Guess what? Nowhere in the Bible does it say because you love God, you're going to make it. Nowhere in the Bible says because you're a good person. Nowhere we think that because Hollywood has trained us to think if we're good enough, we'll make it. Can I tell you something? No one's good enough to make it. Jesus had to go substitutionally to that cross to take your place and mine too. Today, all of us that are in here need to understand that God's calling some of you home. Some of you have been messing up with God. This is not about money now. This is about your soul. It's about you getting right with God. This is more important than anything else that you get right with God. And I'm here to tell you something. Today is your day of salvation. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. I think I'm going to go to heaven because my mom and dad told me I was a Christian when I was a kid. They took me to catechism class or Sunday school or Sabbath school class when I was a child. You know, they put a cross or a St. Christopher around my neck when I was a kid. Can I tell you something? Nowhere in the Bible say your mom and dad taking those classes get you to heaven. Have you christened or baptized as a baby? Nowhere. You're not going to make it and somebody needs to love you enough to tell you the truth. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim. I joined my last church. It was a Christian church. I sang in the choir for years. I, I, I helped the pastor. I was a leader in my last church. Can I tell you something? Where does it say you join the choir, help the pastor, become a leader in a church, you get to go to heaven? You're not going to make it if you think that's going to get you to heaven. You're not going to make it. And somebody needs to love you enough, respect you, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Now listen to me. Listen to me. Listen to me. Your life eternally is at stake right now. Listen to my words. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Jim, you don't understand. I, 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 I really believe that uh, I'm going to be okay and I'm going to make it. Can I tell you something? You can believe that all you want. But Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. In other words, in order for you to get to heaven, you're going to have to get to heaven his way, not your way, not my way, or some well-meaning church committee's way. You're going to have to get there his way. And he tells us exactly in the scripture how to get to heaven. Can I tell you? John 3rd chapter, he says, you must be born again. Must be born again. Now the problem with that is most people don't know what born again means. Did you know that most people attend American churches really don't know what born again means? All they know is they don't like people that are born again because Hollywood has portrayed them as idiots and fools. But that's not what he's talking about. Born again means something. Here's what it means from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. It means you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with Jesus Christ. All or nothing, and I'll prove it to you. Last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation, Jesus himself is speaking. He says, I'm coming again, and when I come, I better find you hot or I better find you cold. Because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. That's what Jesus said. Wow. You know what he just really said? People who call themselves Christians that are lukewarm are not real Christians at all. And they're not going to make it to heaven. What's lukewarm? Let's define that. Little in, little out. Little up, little down. Lukewarm, token prayer, occasional church attendance. Lukewarm, God is something in your life, but he's not everything. Lukewarm, you're not against God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Hear me now, hear me. You're not wholehearted for God. He is just something. Today, I want you to know something. He'll never be something until you make him everything. That's what this is all about. You must be born again. I already know. You know who Jesus is? 
You celebrate Christmas, I already know that. You know about Easter and the resurrection, I already know you know who Jesus is. Even the devil knows who Jesus is and he's not going to heaven. So what you have in your head won't get you there. It's about what you've done with your heart. Somebody needs to love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough, stop playing games, stop playing church and tell you the truth. Have you given God all of your heart? Have you given God all of your life? You know why you gotta give it to him? Because he's not a thief to rob it from you. He's not a conniver to talk you out of it. He's not a manipulator to make you do it. He's not floating around some cosmic cloud with a two by four hitting you in the head, making you do this. He could have made you do it, but he does. He gives you a free will choice. I choose to give God all of my heart. I choose to give God all my life, make Jesus the Lord and Savior of my life. That means boss of everything. And if you haven't done that, you're not saved and someone needs to tell you. Today is your day of salvation. You say, well, Pastor Jim, how do I get right with God? You're going to have to give him all of your heart, give him all of your life. In a moment, I'll, I'll count to three. I'll go like this. I'll go one, two, and I'll pound my hands together when I say three. I'll go three and I'll go bang. When you hear that sound, bang your hand goes up. What you're saying by the raising of your hand is I don't want Jesus uh, uh, just in my head. I want to give him all of my heart, give him all of my life, be born again, headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up and you can put it right back down. Jesus said these words. Listen to what Jesus said. If you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. You sit there and you know you need to get right with God. Sit there with your arms crossed, staring at me. Instead of getting right with God, there'll be a day when you stand before God and he said he will deny you. Don't let that happen to you today. Today, if you know you need to give him all of your heart, you know you need to give him all of your life, you get your hand up and let me see it and then put it right back down. You say, Pastor Jim, if I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. People that I came with will see it. People behind me will see it. I'll feel funny. Yep, you might. Get over it. It's better to feel funny in a safe place like this than to be in hell forever and ever and ever and ever because you care more about what people see instead of what God sees? I don't think so. Today is your day of salvation. If Jesus can go a beaten bloody mess to the cross for you and die, then you can get your hand up in a safe place like this. Today is your salvation. Again, if you've been running from God, instead of to God, get ready to put your hand up. If you've never given him all of your heart, get ready to put your hand up. If you're one of those people that are not sure, make sure. If there's somebody in here saying, well, I prayed with Billy Graham or a Harvest Crusade, but I never followed up with all of my heart and life. Can I tell you something? There's no magical abracadabra formula of words that you call a prayer that'll get you in heaven. It doesn't work that way. God watches your life to see whether or not your, uh, that your life is following your heart, whether or not it's real. Today is your day of salvation. I'm counting to three, I'm popping my hands together. Somebody has told you the truth. Now will you respond? It's your call. All across this auditorium, back in the family room, in the foyer by television, back down there in the food court, put the burrito down, I'm talking to you, get ready to put your hand up. Are you ready? Here it is. One, two, three. Let me see your hands, let me see your hands. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Thank you, 16, back over here. Thank you, there's 17, God bless you. There's 18, 19, 20, thank you. Back on this top, top. wave at me back here. 20, 21, thank you, 22, thank you, 23, thank you. 24, 25, 26, thank you, 27, thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? Where's, where are you? 28. You know you need to, there's 28. Wave at me. I, are there point, oh, 28. God bless you. Anybody else? Real quick. There's 28. Where are you? 29. I know there's a couple more of you that need to get your hand up. I just feel you. There's 29. Where are you? 30. There's 30 back up on top. God bless you. Let's give the Lord a great big praise. Isn't God good? Now for all of you, for all of you that are in here, you have no idea what just took place. Spiritually, who comes to the Lord when you preach about money? Unless what you preach is of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit brings the people. So in front of you, in front of you, you saw a manifestation of the presence of God. 
Can I tell you something? There's four or five of you in this section right here that need to get right with God. You know it. There's a couple, three more up here. There's three or four more up there. There's another three or five. There's five more back here. Two more back in that family room. There's three more in this family room. I just know that you didn't get your hand up and you need to get right with God and stop messing with God. Today's your day. But here's what I'm going to ask. All 30 of you and anybody that should have raised their hand, but you didn't. I want you to get a hold of your coat, purse, sweater, Bible, friend. I want you to get out of your seat, get in the aisle, and meet me right here in front. Wait a minute. You don't get saved by raising your hand. I want you to walk these aisles, give your heart and life to Jesus, and are serious about it. If you raised your hand, you're serious. Don't mess with me. Don't mess with God. You get out of your seat, get in the aisle, bring your stuff, bring a friend. I'll meet you right here in front. You come right now. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Lord, I give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. Come on, come on, come on, come on. You alone, every come on. breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I'll give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. Come on, come on. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand as they come. I'll live for you alone, every breath that I take. Oh, they're coming. Give them a hand. Every Give them a hand as they come. I'm away. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. Lord, have your way. They're coming. They're coming. They're coming. In me. Lord, I give you my heart. I'll give you my soul. I'll give for you. Thank God you guys have come. I just want to point out to you, I want you all to look to your left. See this guy waving at you? His name is Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave is a really good guy. No weird stuff. No strange stuff. He's going to do three things. Let me tell you what they are. Number one, he's going to lead you in a prayer so you can invite Jesus into your heart. That's number one. Number two, he's going to give you some free information, literature that you can take home and read about. Now that you're a Christian, what in the heck does God want from you now? I mean, that's important. He didn't want to just make you a Christian, pay for that, and then let you just flounder around like a fish out of the water. He wants to help you. Let us help you do that. Is that okay? Number three, he's going to introduce you to a program that we have called Spiritual Personal Trainer. So it's so people that will meet with you four or five times, go over some scripture. They're friends. They'll buy you coffee, tea, nachos. They'll encourage you. They'll pray for you during the week. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. You said you're going to give God all of your heart. You said you're going to give God all of your life. I'm asking something different. I'm asking that you give this church one year of your life. In one year, you will be blown away by the blessings that you walk in and live in. Now, wait a minute. And the re listen to this. One year of your life, one year from today, you will be so blessed if you give us one year of your life that the rest of the years of your life will be amazing. You will have the blessings of the Lord. You will have the power of God. You will have the open doors and your heart's desires will come to pass because my God will meet your needs. Uh, I tell you, according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. But it'll cost you, you, and it'll cost you one year. So I want you to do this. I want you to take a moment and go with Pastor Dave. Only takes a few moments. People you came with will wait for you. Make a left turn and follow Pastor Dave right over there. Thank you, Pastor Dave. Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise.